How's it going, folks? Craig Udelman here at Old Time Central once again. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a special session today, answering some questions that uh, y'all have submitted on the old Facebook and such. Uh, so I hope you enjoy, and um, if you have more questions, feel free to drop them over there on a comment, and uh, maybe we'll do this again one day. Great. So one question was about choosing strings for a fiddle. What are your thoughts on that, steel or synthetic or... Right, so there's always this big debate. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I think you can find a lot of info on the different forums. Um, but I will say, I don't think there's any right answer to this question. Um, yeah, traditionally I'd say fiddlers used steel or gut strings, right? They didn't have all these synthetic stuff back in the day. Um, so if you're kind of obsessed with getting that old sound, that might be the, the way to go. Um, I tend to think it really depends on your sound, on the feel that you want from the strings and your fiddle. Um, like I use different strings on different fiddles and honestly I'm kind of always changing and trying and I don't think I have exactly a favorite. Um, you know, if your fiddle is a bit darker or if you want to really be heard at a session and cut through as much as possible, then steel strings are definitely going to generally be a great way to go. Um, if your fiddle is already pretty bright or you have problems with sort of squeaky, stretchy stuff, then then synthetic strings will usually help. Um, yeah, I really go back and forth. Um, and then, yeah, again, for the feel also, synthetic strings, I think, are generally a bit easier to play. Um, you know, of course, it depends on the string, on which gauge you have or whatever. There's generally kind of a light, medium, and heavy. Um, the lighter ones will be a bit easier to play, but the, the heavier ones will give you kind of a stronger, clearer sound. I tend to like actually having a bit of a higher action and strong strings, um, but I've also, you know, I've been playing for 30 years and started out with classical stuff, so my, my fingers sort of are well trained to handle all of that. Um, if you're having a bit of trouble with that or feel like you could get more fluidity, then you might try a lighter gauge string or something synthetic. Um, you know, I think a lot of people seem to have something against the dominance because they're sort of, I don't know, standard synthetic thing. But I find as far as like a general string, like they actually work pretty well on most fiddles. Um, especially there are all these new like Vision Titanium and whatever things they have. Um, but there's a lot of different things. I mean, a lot of people like the Helicores or Helicores. Uh, I found that when I do a lot of cross tuning and changing of tunings, those things tend to break on me. Uh, I think a lot of other people don't have that problem, but I tend not to use them because of that. Um, I like prims a lot on, on most of my fiddles, especially the, the darker sounding fiddles that I have. Um, so yeah, I think it's great to try different things and then maybe even record yourself with them and, and see how it sounds, see how it feels. Um, you know, obviously budget is, is a big concern. Um, and again, it really depends on your fiddle. So. Yeah, not a clear answer, but I hope, hope that helps. Many people have asked how you go about picking up a tune that you don't know in a jam session. Ah, uh, great question. Um, I think it's something that you get better and better at. You sort of have to learn how to do it in a way. Uh, so, the, I mean, the best practice is just to go to sessions and try and do it or flip on a CD or, or YouTube or something and just play along with tunes and, and force yourself to do it at home also. Um, I definitely have some, some strategies that I think are helpful. Uh, obviously, knowing what key the tune is in is it's gonna be really helpful, which usually in an old time session is, is not too difficult since we stay in keys. Um, and if you know your way around the, the arpeggios and, and the scales of, you know, the major chords in that key, that will also really help you because, you know, usually these tunes are either moving in scales or arpeggios. Um, I think, uh, let's see, one good thing is don't jump in right away and just play anything and then try and get it um, unless you're already really good at getting tunes. Uh, but anyways, it's always great to listen at least once. Um, and then I'll usually try and pick out sort of like some important notes or sort of like milestones, markers within the tune. Um, you know, so the first thing is what note does it start on, right? Like uh, if you don't have that, you're not probably going to get so much of the tune. So start with that and then, okay, does it go up or down? 
and what note is it going to? So, you know, if the first time around you kind of, you know, you get the idea of, okay, it starts on the G on the E string and it's sort of doing a little noodle that's going down to a D. It's like, okay, so that's, that's a good chunk. And then what happens afterwards? Um, try and remember sort of how many, you know, is it one phrase that repeats a bunch of times or is it a longer tune that sort of meanders around? Um, and then, okay, how many times does it repeat? Does it go up or down the first or the second time? So if you kind of start making a bit of like a, a visual map or something or an audio map of the tune as it's happening, then, then that'll kind of give you a good idea of where it's going. And, you know, it's quite likely that you're not going to get every note of the tune but if you can get something that's that's close to it, then then at least you can kind of play along and hopefully, you know, you won't destroy it. Um, you know, some people feel like it has to be exactly the same. You can also see like who's leading the tune. Are they playing it the same way every time? You know, if so, then you should really probably try to get close to what they're doing. If they're changing it a lot, then you can maybe also just find an idea of the tune. And, you know, and it's because it's going to be tricky then anyways to decide what's the actual tune if they're playing a lot of variations. Um, definitely, I think keeping it simple, right? It's much better to play a st more simple version where you're only maybe playing quarter notes in plus some places where they're playing eighth notes um, so that you let the person who's leading it kind of really show the details and you're kind of playing along and getting, getting the basic structure of and supporting what they're doing. Um, of course, if you can't hear what they're doing, you're not going to be able to get it, right? So making sure that you're not playing too loud when someone else is leading the tune, really even once you've gotten it, but especially if you're not sure what you're doing. Um, and I don't know, I feel like I am have, you know, it's something that I've just done a lot, you know, both in old time sessions and whatever, swing and klezmer sessions and just like, you know, busking on the street with people you don't know and whatever. So it's like you definitely kind of train your ear as you get better at it. Um, and if you're sort of okay at it, then I think you can kind of play the tune and just keep an ear out for which parts are you not doing the same way and try to make a marker in your head and then the next time it comes around, you know, try something different or even better sometimes, like if I don't get it a few times, when it gets to that part, I'll just stop playing for a second and listen to what they're doing. So in that way, I can jump in on the tune a bit sooner, you know, and it is a jam, right? Like we're, we're there to play together. You don't have to sit out until you know the whole tune. Um, but if you really want to get it, then you can play along and, oh, like, what's he really doing on the ending? Like, okay, I'm just going to stop there, you know, and not in like a big way where I'm announcing to everybody and putting my fiddle down, but just kind of like, and maybe lean in and really, really listen to what they're doing. Um, and sometimes even all afterwards, I'll just really quietly sort of play what I think that line is over, you know, whatever they're doing or under, I should say, because I'll do it extremely quietly and only, you know, if it kind of makes sense harmonically. So that I try to get it in my fingers and then when it comes around, I try to put that in and see if I got it. And if I didn't, then maybe the next time I'll do it again. Um, so yeah, there, you know, there's a few strategies. Again, really like trying to just pick out the, the shape of the tune. Like I really tend to think in like almost like a graph of like, okay, it's starting here. You know, so I'm sort of seeing it going by and then remembering, okay, that's the first part. Okay, the B part is this roughly, and then as you go, you fill in the the gaps. Um, you know, and most tunes tend to have these same sort of passages, right? So there's just like typical ways of going like do 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 ba do ba do ba do ba do or whatever. So the more tunes you learn, I think the easier it gets. Um, and then you can always try to look out for those things. Uh, and usually if it happens once, there's a good chance that it might do the same thing at some other part of the tune, you know, or like if the ending is a certain thing on the A part, it's likely that there might be a similar ending in the B part or whatever, right? So you sort of like try to grab those bits and put them together. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps and really just, just try it to keep going. Um, try not to be afraid and don't be afraid to play a simpler version of the tune, right? That's, that can really be key. And, and don't forget that you can practice at home. Uh, using using recordings and whatnot. How do you keep chestnuts fun to play? A great question. I mean, I, for me, like I, they just are fun to play. Generally, you know, there's a couple tunes, whatever. I, almost maybe any tune. If you play it too much, okay, it's gonna get a bit bored. Like there was a good couple years where I just couldn't play Tennessee Mountain Fox Chase anymore. Um, but now it's fun again because I didn't play it too much. Uh, 
So I think maybe that's one answer is uh, if you're playing them a lot, uh, just take a break sometimes and that's okay, you know, or like, you know, you can even use that time to get a drink or go to a bathroom in a session if it's like, you know, a tune that's really driving you crazy. Um, but I think even, I don't know, there's always ways to find something in a tune, right? And the good tunes that have lasted and that become chestnuts are such because they're good tunes, right? Um, even if they're really simple, there's just something there that works. Um, so for me, definitely a big part of it is, yeah, finding different variations maybe, um, you know, which, uh, whatever, I, you know, we deal with that a fair amount in some of the lessons, but just taking any of the phrases and thinking, oh, like, what can I do to get the same idea out differently? Trying a different bowing, trying a different fingering, you know, doing a, a different kind of a doodle doodle, you know, um, so whatever that is, I think that can really help. Um, you know, you can always try playing tunes in different keys even, um, just to see what that does to your, your mind. I think it's sort of a great exercise. Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes you find nice things. Some, some D tunes sound great in C, you know, or, uh, some, some A tunes, cross tunes can be really fun in standard tuning, uh, things like that. Um, so that can always be fun. I also, I mean, I like to sort of play with weird tunings, you know, and like, uh, if there's a tune that's in sort of G and E minor, I might drop my G string down to an E or, uh, or if it's a tune, I don't know, uh, an F tune, maybe drop my G to an F, you know, and you find weird tunings like F dad and like, actually it's pretty cool for certain things. Um, so I think on like a kind of personal level, that stuff can really work. Um, and then otherwise, I think also just finding different versions of tunes, right? If you have your way that you play and you've always played it that way, you know, go, go on YouTube or Slippery Hill and just try to find a bunch of different versions and see if you can find a different way of playing the tune. Um, you know, and especially with the real chestnuts, you know, Soldier's Joy and Cripple Creek and things like that. There are just so many different ways to play the tune, so it shouldn't be too hard to find another version. Um, and then you can either, you know, just play a different version for a while or see if you can take a few things from that version, integrate it with, your, with the way you've been playing it, the other version, you know, and eventually find your own version. Um, and I think that that can be a really fun way to do it. Um, or if you're in a session, you know, similarly, you can see what other people are doing and try instead of playing it the way you do it and listen, you know, and have them play the way they do it, really try and catch what they're doing and adjust to it. Um, so use that as kind of an inspiration to, to find something new in the tune. Um, there's also a bit of a mental thing, I think, if just sometimes they're like, oh, like, really, you want to play old Joe Clark, you know, instead of just being like, yeah, let's play that tune and, you know, and find something fun in it. Um, and I think often if you just sort of open yourself to it and try to enjoy the tune, then you're more likely to find something in it. Um, also, if you like to sing, I think learning the words to some of those tunes and singing them a bit, you know, in sessions or at home or whatever it is. Um, that can be a way to sort of connect on a deeper level. Um, so I like to do that. Um, yeah, those are probably my, my main ideas about it. I do think it's really, it's really important to play all those tunes, you know. There's, there's so many good tunes that now it's like we get into the crooked tunes, we get into the rags and the different things, which, which I love. Um, but, you know, I think every old-time fiddler should play at least one or two versions of the Cripple Creek, Soldier's Joy, The Ever See Devil, Uncle Joe, Hop High Ladies, you know, um, all these kinds of things, you know, there, there's a long list of things that sort of often get overlooked, I think, especially in places where people are kind of less a part of like a, a scene or less, you know, in a place where the music really comes from. And so they're always looking for what's the cool thing, you know, what's sort of this weird tune that has that funny chord. Um, but sometimes just, just a good simple melody is enough. How do you go about finding new tunes? Ah, uh, new tunes, yes. Always always on the hunt for new tunes. Um, well, um, a mix of ways, I guess. Um, you know, it depends on your personality and what your goals are with, with the music. Um, like, for me, I don't know, I like to get tunes from different the different fiddlers, right? I kind of feel like I want to have some representations of, of most of the main fiddlers that I listen to or like from the old days and like, and that gives me a better picture 
of what this music is and kind of allows me to play in a way that I feel, you know, good about representing this culture. And um, so often, I mean, I'll go maybe go on Slippery Hill or something and just, you know, or through my, my collection or through YouTube and just think about different fiddlers and, and search through their songs and, and find, find a tune that I like and then learn it, you know. So it's like, oh, like I, you know, I really don't know that many John Ashby tunes or, you know, or like I haven't learned a new one in a long time. Let me, let me find something of his that I like, you know. Okay, oh, what about something from, you know, Eden Hammonds or some West Virginia tune and like, oh, like there's all this Mississippi stuff that's come out recently. Like, you know, let me check out some of those guys. Um, so I think just yeah, going through kind of by fiddler or by region um, or by collection of things from a certain region uh, can be a great way to discover tunes and sort of gives you enough of like a, a focus that you can actually find something you like. Um, I mean, sometimes I'll also just go through Slippery Hill and just go down tune by tune through the whole collection and just listen. Um, and I think even if you don't actually learn the tunes, just listening to as many tunes as you can can also be be helpful, you know, just hearing like what are these different styles, especially the people that, that didn't record professionally, you know, and sort of just hearing the different field recordings and like understanding the the breadth or, uh, or you know, or depth or whatever of old time fiddle styles. Um, I think another another way of sort of honing it down is um is going by by key or by tuning. Um, I think it's great to, you know, have a good mix of tunes. Like I tend to love a lot of sort of standard tuning tunes. I don't know, it's like just a lot of these sort of like Doc Roberts and, and Buddy Thomas and kind of things, things that I like, you know, there's, just, yeah, they, they often seem to be in G. It's also like a great place for me to sing. Um, so I have to kind of push myself sometimes to learn more cross tunes or learn, you know, or like, oh, I don't really play very many cross D tunes, you know, maybe I should learn some more of those. So sort of like just trying to get a good representation of everything, um, that can be really helpful. Uh, and Slippery Hill is great for that because you can search by tuning also. Um, of course, just going to sessions and, and, you know, finding a tune you like and then trying to learn it is, is a great way to do it. Um, I think... You have to be just a little bit careful not to be one of these people that's sort of like asking what the name of that tune was after every single tune in a session. Um, you know, okay, if you're really going to learn them all, then, you know, maybe that's fine if you're just that excited about it. Like, you know, hopefully it won't be that annoying to people. Um, but sometimes you just get the feeling that, like, the flow of a session can somehow be a little bit interrupted and like whatever you know to each their own if that's if that makes you happy and you just want to write down in your notebook every tune that you've ever played in a session great you know like you know no, no one should be that upset about it uh but I, you know my advice would be to sort of pick the ones that you really like and then, and then learn those ones you know if you're just getting into it then yeah you go to a session probably every tune is going to sound great but you're not going to necessarily learn them all so um maybe try not to do that every single time um, you know, and it can be nice to record a session and then you can go back and, and pick out the tunes that you like. Um, and if you didn't ask somebody the name, then you can always, you know, play it for a friend that knows a lot of tunes or post it into some online group and somebody should be able to tell you what the name of the tune is and then go and find other versions of it. Right. I think that's always important is like, don't just learn sort of the session version of the tune. You know, if you can, try and find an old version, you know, you decide you want to learn it to look for it on Slippery Hill, you know, or somewhere, just Google it and see who recorded the tune, see if you can find some of those recordings, then, you know, maybe pick a version you like, or then you can go to YouTube and find whatever, you know, lesson videos there are, or just videos of people to get Boeings and things. Um, but it really, uh, for me, it's like going back to the older recordings, at least to listen to them and understand them, and then you can hear somebody playing it in a more modern recording where maybe it's easier to learn from and you can try and learn from that and then maybe go back to the old recording and see how what you're doing is different from that. Um, but that process of sort of having like a depth of a relationship to the tune is great. Um, and of course, trying to understand the context of the tune, you know, if there are lyrics or there used to be lyrics is always helpful. Um, so it's great to learn about the tunes, learn about the fiddlers and not, not just sort of pick up the notes. Um, so yeah, that's mostly it. I think, I mean, I'll tend to make playlists for myself and then listen to the tunes kind of all the time. 
you know, and so whatever. I have my iTunes playlist of things I've downloaded from Slippery Hill, and then I have my YouTube playlist of videos that I've liked, and, you know, when I'm commuting somewhere or just sitting around the house, whatever it is, I'll put on those playlists so that I listen to them a lot of times, and then by the time I sit down to play it, I already kind of know the tune, and then it's just a matter of working it out of my fingers. Um, so I think that's a really useful technique. Um, and probably not trying to learn too many tunes at once also is helpful. I think like you want to be learning new tunes, but um, but don't overload yourself uh, if you can't handle it. Um, yeah, I don't know. And otherwise, of course, like whatever, listen to the CDs of contemporary bands that you like and find what they're doing. And that's always a good way to find tunes. I think, again, if you do that, then try and go and see where they learned it from and, and ideally learn it from the source itself. Um, but whatever, you know, if you like the Foghorn version of it, then like learn that version and I'm sure it's great. Uh, you know, so it's like, ideally we are all are sort of having a bit of a creative and a personal moment with how we play the tune, but it doesn't have to be that way, you know, and whatever, whatever you like is, is what's good for you. Uh, how do you figure out the Boeing for audio recordings and you don't have a, don't have a video see how, how the Boeing goes. Right. So this is a, it's a tricky thing, right? It's um, more or less impossible. Let's just sort of establish that, that, you know, like, okay, on some recordings you can really hear most of it. Uh, but if you ask me, you're like, it's a small chance that you're going to get the exact same Boeing. Um, that said, I think, you know, that's our main way of learning about the style is by listening to these old recordings and trying to imitate them. Um, so I think it's still an invaluable experience. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. For me, I think, of course, you know, the simple answer is listen to the recording and try and hear where the Boeing is changing and then do something like that, right? Um, but let's see if we can give you a little bit more helpful information than that. Um, so yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, really listen to the recording um, and try and hear, I think first just to establish a general idea of like, is this person slurring lots of notes or are they mostly separating them? You know, are they doing some kinds of like slur groupings that aren't straight, you know, not just like da 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 you know, is there do be a ba do ba do ba ba da do do da da da? You know, or is it dump a do 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 dump dump a do 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 dump dump do 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 that kind of stuff, right? So it's like, and of course, if you first have some of those patterns kind of in your hand, you know, ideally either from taking lessons or watching videos or or learning tunes or even reading them in in books sometimes, um, that will help to be able to then recognize them when you hear them in tunes, right? And so it's just something that you definitely just get better and better at the more you do it. Um, Sometimes you can hear the bow change. Um, sometimes I find that if I turn up the treble, like the higher frequencies in, a, in my player or whatever, as I'm listening, then that'll bring out a little bit more of those sort of like scratchy bits that help tell you when the bow is changing. Uh, so that can be useful. Um, slowing down the recordings, of course, can be great. You know, YouTube now has this thing where you can slow down. Uh, and you can even go to custom and choose how fast you're slowing it down. You know, so I think kind of often listening at whatever, you know, 70, 80% is like, can be really helpful. Um, I think that slowing down is really useful for learning tunes, but then also there's a danger of learning everything really slowly and sort of like losing the groove of it. And then sort of like maybe getting the bowing or the idea of what the tune is, but not having actually the feeling. So... I think it's really helpful at first to try to like listen to it a bunch of times at speed, have an idea of sort of how it's working. Then, you know, for me at least, I try to learn at speed as much as I can, then slow down to get the bits that, I, that I'm not sure about or slow down to check what I'm doing um, or maybe to check Boeing things um, and then go back up to speed and really try and play along with it and see if what I'm doing is matching. Ideally, maybe then record yourself, listen to that, listen to the recording and sort of check um, yeah, I don't know if there's drone notes, sometimes that makes it a bit easier to hear if there's a Boeing change, uh, because you hear the, the scratchiness of it kind of getting against the drone. Um, I would say also like with the older fiddlers and the older styles, there's just a lot more individual 
bowed notes and less slurring than than what we tend to think of. You know, of course, it's, there's a lot of different personal and regional styles. Um, but I would, if I had a general sort of thought about it, I would say that there tend to be more single notes and, and some of the best fiddlers, you know, especially the slightly more refined people, Doc Roberts, like Robertson, maybe some people like, they can play a, a passage with single notes and it sounds sort of like it's slurred, you know, if you, if you don't really listen carefully, you know, or if you didn't know better. Um, and that's an important skill to work on, I think, on our own. Um, and just something to kind of be aware of, like just because something sounds relatively smooth or you don't hear a clear bow change, it doesn't mean they're not changing the bow. Um, yeah, and so I think like, yeah, and if you work and if you learn sort of multiple tunes from the same fiddler, you kind of get a sense also of how they bow. So that can be really helpful if you're really sort of trying to get inside a tune is like spend some time with that, that fiddler's repertoire and see if you can figure out like, oh, like they often tend to do this kind of a bowing on this kind of a phrase. Um, yeah, what else? I don't know. I think um, like quite a few old time fiddlers will do things where they'll kind of do two bows in the same direction on the same bow, but it's not necessarily changing direction. Um, you know, so like that can just be a useful tool in your bowing in general. And when listening to recordings, you can kind of like keep in mind that that might happen. Um, you know, different ways of, of also rocking the bow between strings. Like sometimes it can sound like it's a bow change, but it's a slur across the strings. Uh, or the opposite, it can sound like it's two notes in the same direction, but they're actually just really smoothly doing a string crossing or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of tricky things about that. Um, but yeah, and listening also in general, not just for the bowing, but sort of for whatever, for drone notes and things and really trying to get the subtleties of recording, I think is really great. Um, and that might give you ideas about what's happening with the bow. You know, if there's, if they're hitting a drone note here, then, you know, they, whatever, they must be doing something like this. Um, of course, if you have any videos of the fiddler that you're trying to learn the tune from, that's going to be really helpful to, to get a sense of their style, you know, and even just to see what it looks like when they play, you know, like, like Melvin Wine, I think is such a great fiddler to watch these videos of, you know, there's just like this, yeah, I don't know, he just really puts the bow on the string in a great way. And like, sometimes like I'll try and play those tunes and just like, yeah, just try and get that feeling, you know, um, same with Tommy Gerald, it's a little bit more mystical kind of like, you know, what he's doing and, or I don't know, like it's, it's less sort of like clear and yeah. Um, but I think trying to sort of see what the feeling of their body is and get that feeling in your body can, can be a subtle way also to help with that. Um, yeah. And I don't know. And for me, it's like, I don't, I don't feel like I need to bow it the same way that the recording does. Um, but I probably want to be able to at least get the same effect that the recording does. Right. Um, so yeah, especially with these kind of Doc Roberts tunes and things that are like sort of smooth and just like have these little slurs, but it's more of a separate note thing. Like, you know, if I slur the first note and then do two separate or, you know, or slur into the first note and then do three separate or something like, I'm not really too worried about it. I don't, I'm not somebody who believes that we all have to bow exactly the same way, but that doesn't mean that I'm not trying to get the feeling of it still. Um, so I think like, you know, even if you don't actually get the bowing they get, just trying to get get the feeling of the way they play the tune is, is maybe more important. Um, and I think it's important, I don't know, to sort of watch out for tendencies that we have or maybe like see if there's certain things that some fiddlers do that you don't ever do. Um, some people always slur across the strings and for some people that's like, it feels unnatural. Um, you know, some people do a lot of like dumpy or these sort of like, you know, more complicated patterns that aren't just shuffle or, or separate bows. Um, so kind of practicing some of those, I think, can be really helpful. Um, and I'll often do that with like some standard kind of notey passage of a tune. Uh, here, I'll show you what I mean. So like um, something like... Right, it's like you have a lot of variations of that in different tunes, you know. You can think of that as like the end of Arkansas Traveler or something. Um, but so that could be separate. Uh, okay, I slurred the very last one. That could be shuffle. 
could be slurs of threes and, and like three, three, two separate. Right. That's, you know, that's sort of a, <coughs> I would say, more common maybe in some kind of bluegrass and like, or, or more, you know, 40s, 30s, like modern styles. Um, but also going back into, you know, it's all over the place. Um, and then other sort of weirder combinations. You know, more longbow things. something like that but just going through it and putting all those different patterns into your fingers you know can be really helpful then so when you go through you're like oh it sounds like it's something like this you know and you have all the possibilities and you've sort of opened your mind to things that aren't necessarily what you do by default um so i find that to be really really helpful um you know and i don't do that as much anymore because i think i have them kind of ingrained in myself more than i used to but i definitely when i was sort of jumping to the next level of old time fiddling would just take a passage like that and try and play all those different bowing patterns and repeat them and then maybe just loop something like that and just naturally let things come out of it and and see what happens and and practice also doing that and then ending on an up bow right so like sort of letting your bowing become to where you're phrasing and you're thinking about the music you're making and not the physical bowing that you're doing but you know finding the ways to get yourself back on track um and usually in a tune i'll sort of look for places like that where i can get my bow around you know either some place where i can slur something or if there's something like uh you know then i can go or and those will both get me to the same place right down down or down up down up or if my bowing is off then i can go slur one and separate one and suddenly i've come you know instead of changing the direction of that phrase, it's all going the same direction, which means I'll now start on a down bow, right? Or something like that can be, or, right? So if I find myself starting that up bow, then I'll change the bowing on it, and suddenly I'm now ready to start on a down bow again. Um, so yeah, finding those bits of the tune where you can sort of correct yourself is great. Um, and just as much as you can, listen, you know, Try to pick out, okay, if you're sure there's a couple slurs here and there for sure, then okay, I'll get that bit and now try different things in between and fill it in and see if it works. Get a bowing that works for you and then, you know, then put it back together, listen again and, and see if you're right. Um, but I would also, I would always, I think, try to learn the tune first if you're learning from a recording without worrying about the bowing and get the tune and like, you know, the idea of what works and then really try and get the subtleties of the bowing. Hope that helps. One reader asked uh, you to talk about what you think the the real essentials are for uh, beginner fiddlers in terms of bowing. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I'd say we did a couple of videos on uh, what, we, what I like to call circle bowing and um, in general right hand bowing technique for old time fiddle. So please check those out. And I'm not going to go into so much detail about those things uh, because that's already there. Um, but I'll try and give you a rough idea of some of the general bowing patterns or ideas about bowing approaches. Um, and also just some general, more metaphysical ideas about using the bow. Um, and yeah, so I mean, first of all, I guess I would say, I think uh, just the idea of separate bows is something that we don't think about enough. Um, and often like you think, okay, oh, if it's just like dugga, 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 okay, I can do that. Um, but actually like the ability to play just a passage of eighth notes or even quarter notes with a bow that has the right kind of groove in it is, is actually quite difficult. Um, so I think for even for advanced players, that's a great thing to work on. Um, and if you feel like your tunes sound pretty good, but they don't have quite that kick that you want, that might be a great place to, to start or to kind of investigate. Um, and so, you know, some of, cause some of my favorite fiddlers, like, yeah, there's just like, there's this, there's space within their playing and there's just like a direction to every note. Um, 
you know, and like for example, like you could play, let's take Soldier's Joy, uh, you know, and it could be something like. You know, which it's like, that's fine. It's pretty, I don't know, you could, you could dance to it. Um, but when I think about like somebody like Doc Roberts or a lot of other people, like, you know, there's something like. You know, whatever, these sort of like places where it lands in the tune to give it like a nice momentum, a nice groove, you know, or or some more like, uh, you know, like playing from like the skill lickers in Georgia and stuff. It's a... <laughs> like that like something a little bit more dirty and driving there's a lot of different ways to play quarter notes and eighth notes and make them actually groove right so so just putting attention into that i think is, is a great starting place first of all um and yeah when i play quarter notes i don't know i generally either i'm thinking about sort of or sorry eighth notes you know where my wrist is really moving kind of up and down which I then, you know, I, I rotate my arm in, so that becomes like this, but so it's sort of a straight line thing, or the circular thing, which gets a really nice... Uh, so yeah, you can check out the, the video on circle bowing for more about that. Um, but it's good to at least have those two sort of basic ways of using your wrist and, and really work on them. Um, and I would maybe pick a, a notey tune, you know, something like that, or in something that ideally you know pretty well. You know, maybe even Cripple Creek. You know, and just try and play it probably slower than that at a place where you can really make it groove and just work on, on getting that right kind of drive in your, in your bowing. Um, you could even just play scales, you know, and do it both in more straight and a more swung way, you know. If you're that kind of person, that, that could be really helpful. Um, something like that also, where you have like a bit of a stop. And there I'm doing kind of a retake bowing, which sometimes you'll find can be useful. So that's two downs. You know, whatever. Ideally, you can play with it and find your own sort of patterns. You know, find find a scale or find a section of a tune that has that kind of a thing, um, and then you can play different different patterns with it. Um, so that's the most basic, right? It's just separate bows. Um, the other main things that you're going to have are some sort of a shuffle, right? Long, short, short, long, uh, and that can be, you know. It's really like you're playing all those. You know, something like that. There's like fire on my pretty little miss. Or you can be using that with with slur, you know, slurring notes so that you get like a as an example so I'm using this the shuffle pattern to play multiple notes um, right, 
maybe that's a better example. So right, slur, separate, slur, separate. Verse, you know, so I mean, ideally you can play it like that, or you can do the separate. Um, the other pattern that you'll get a fair amount, um, which I think can be really great, is slurring three, and then three, and then two separate. And usually to me, like, this is sort of more of an idea of just slurring across the lines, right? So instead of everything being on the downbeat, um, it could be... You know, I usually will use that kind of like more from doing it something like. Right, so when you're playing a bit faster, especially that can help to get kind of a swing and keep it smooth. Um, you know, or on this fast side. Right, so there's sort of a similar idea, but not 3-3-2 three, three, really, but just these bowings that are connecting across the notes. Um, and you don't want to do that too much, kind of like you need these some steady downbeats. Um, but you can mess around with this sort of a thing, right? Right, so I'm sort of just using the slurs to make a more kind of, I don't know, sophisticated pattern across. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, whatever, we, we run into a lot of these, uh, you know. So these things where I'm using the shape of a, often a third and a first finger above it, uh, and slurring. Slurring in patterns like that. So it's kind of a similar thing, just da di ya da di ya da di ya da ba da. Um, which is a little bit harder to explain, maybe as like a, a general rule, but it's something to watch out for in tunes and sort of try to integrate into your playing. Um, maybe take a tune like, uh, Molly put the kettle on. And stuff like that, right? Or Sailor Ladies. Something like that. Um, so yeah, that's another typical pattern. Um, so I'm trying to kind of just give you a survey of things to expect um, and maybe you can break some of those down and then try and integrate them into your playing. Uh, you know, I don't know, another typical thing you'll find is, which I think we've taught in certain lesson videos, sort of way of rocking the bow to end a phrase often, you know, or in the middle. Um, where I'm slurring and then sort of giving an accent afterwards. Uh, that's another typical thing that you definitely want to have in your arsenal. Um, and just and just sort of mid bow accents or or um, or changing the getting an extra feeling without changing the bow. That's another thing that really can make a lot of bowing pattern bowings work in a tune. Um, that if you're not doing it will will help you I think with certain tunes you know or whatever that is uh... right you know or uh, I often like to 
start people out playing shortening bread. And to me, that bowing just works really well. You know, and I'll find lots of places, and that's sort of a useful thing, again, also for turning your bowing around if you get off to be able to get back into a, a place that you like. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, you know, the other big thing is all the droning stuff, right? So, uh, getting used to playing a whole melody on two string. You know, which is just shuffling with the drone string and having a good feeling. Uh, and then also really um, using a drone as a specific kind of point of emphasis, um, which you find in a lot of West Virginia fiddling and other places. Uh, So um, it's nice to find a simple tune like that, like shortening bread, and like just practice putting that drone in different places. So you get used to this idea that, oh, when I want to, I can kind of add that in, you know, or maybe it's easier to just learn a tune that has that, um, you know, whichever kind of person you are. I love to break things down and then just work out how I would do it and then find a tune and, and practice using it. What do you like uh, in an old time backup guitar player? Oh, <laughs> when they play the chords that I like. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a tricky one. There's a lot of different styles. Um, and probably that's actually kind of what I like. And same with the banjo player is, is actually somebody that can play in a few different feelings, um, depending on what the tune calls for. Um, you know, of course, I love some nice bass runs uh, when they're sort of in, in a good spot um, and don't get in the way of the groove. Uh, it depends on the context also. Like generally I'm more into the kind of older styles of guitar play. Um, excuse me. Like um, a little bit less of the chuck of the high strings and a little bit more of just the heavy sort of bass. Um, but sometimes for a dance or for certain tunes, it's, it's great to have this kind of cha, 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 really just like steady, super clear thing, you know, or if there's no there's no banjo player or if I'm playing like a square dance with just a guitarist, you know, which I think you can totally do, then yeah, you need a bit more of like a steady full rhythm. Um, so yeah, maybe somebody that listens and sort of fits into the band. Um, but there's a lot of good things, um, a lot of good approaches, you know, sometimes I really like this sort of like jigga 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 jigga, like kind of like a jangly thing with almost no chords and not really like a walking bass and just like a heavy drone like for... For some tunes, I find that it's just really effective. Um, I kind of like when the chords change over the course of the tune, uh, for, for certain tunes at least, um, whereas some people will want them to be always a certain thing. Uh, you know, we all have our taste of how many minor chords to play versus fours, um, which, you know, these days I've sort of embraced some of the the minor six chords you know I, I like a good major six chord every now and then so it's like you know a lot of it's just finding someone who has a similar aesthetic to you i suppose um you know but it's yeah it's always nice to have a change um so they'd be like yeah it's sort of that balance also of playing something really groovy and also leaving enough space on certain tunes right you don't actually have to play every downbeat sometimes just like leaving leaving out a, or leaving, a, you know, sort of a little bit of a space can really, can really make something happen, right? I think that's kind of the key with old time music is not having it all sound the same, you know, in a way that's why I sort of appreciate about it kind of compared to bluegrass or something is like it's tends to not be just dun -chicka -dun -chicka -dun -chicka -dun -chicka -dun -chicka -dun -chicka the whole time, but we have these like funky phrasing. I think as much as everybody in the band can find the phrasing of the tune that really keeps it interesting and keeps it weird. You know, there's other things I like about bluegrass, don't get me wrong. <laughs>